All right, let's get this show on the road. Okay, hello everyone, hope you're well. Um, just a disclaimer, I've been having internet issues since yesterday and it's not just me. It seems like my internet provider did some sort of firmware update and it's kind of been messing with everyone in the New York area. Um, but hopefully um, it's okay. I had office hours earlier and it didn't seem to give me any issues. So let's hope that that will uh, keep up. Uh, we are going to jump right in. We're going to begin. I'm going to share my notes with you and uh, turn off the camera. Okay, so there we go. Here we are. So this is something that we started um, actually on the ninth. Did I, did I start this on the ninth? I believe I started this on the 10th, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. So last time we were looking at modeling with differential equations, we had a bunch of definitions that we had to learn and we wanted to look at some specific applications. Uh, most of our time was spent on mixture problems. And as you might recall, that's about, you have a tank, has some substance in it, some amount of substance is coming in, you're allowing the mixture to leave and you want to figure out how much stuff is in the tank, some sort of solute some dissolved substances in the tank at time t and maybe concentration maybe answer some questions about that it turns out that this thing i mean you describe it to someone and it might sound crazy that you can even identify and actually do that but it turns out that a first order differential equation could actually help us get to the answer and specifically this equation and so when you ever you have a mixer problem of this type this is always the equation that you're going to go towards this is a specific application that applies to this situation only. So um, we did that. We did a bunch of examples with that yesterday. And um, hopefully you, you just have to have these memorized. And we just went through and we learned how to actually read a word problem, pick out the right numbers that we need to actually set up the differential equation and solve the differential equation if necessary. So we're doing that. Uh, we did several examples here. Most of them were separable, but in the worst case scenario, an example like this would be linear. And we can see a cool application there. We also discovered why, when we were looking at the compounding continuously situation, that this can be modeled by a harvesting model. And then we actually want to go through and do this example. And there was another example I left for you guys to try. So hopefully you actually tried that. We will get to that in a little bit. Um, but I wanted you to try the above example. So let's actually jump in. We're going to finish up these two examples. And then uh, we're actually going to move on to a whole other topic. I'm gonna to teach you about a whole other kind of differential equation. We're going to learn to solve it together. Okay, so just to jump back into it. So we know for this sort of situation where something is compounded continuously, and this is going to mention, be mentioned in the problem usually. Um, you know that whenever that is mentioned, you are using the harvesting model to talk about that. So whenever you have some sort of uh, bank account or you have some sort of financial instrument growing with continuously compounded interest, the harvesting model actually helps us solve that as we saw yesterday. So suppose I have a sum S naught and it's invested uh, at an annual rate of return R and it's compounded continuously. Find T, the time required for the original sum to double in value as a function of R. Okay, so that's the first question. Find T. Okay, so A. So we know that but if, if let S of T, because they called it S naught, so I'm just gonna call it S. Let's S of T equals uh, the current value of the investment. Then uh, we know S prime would be equal to R times S. 
So what we're going to do, uh, we want to find the value of t that is going to cause this guy to double in value as a function of r. Now, obviously, that statement does not involve a rate, right? I care about the time required to get the value of s to be a certain value. So that would require us solving this differential equation. Of course, here, this would look like ds over s equals r dt. I can integrate both sides. Can e both sides, and you would get uh, c e to the r t. Now, if t is the time to double, then this means when I plug in big T for time, then the value over here that I would have is double the S value. Well, whatever I started with. And we're, we're also assuming that we started with S naught. Right, because we know that S of zero equals S naught. This will actually mean that C equals S naught. So now we can go through. This is two E to the R big T. And then I can take LN of both sides. And finally, I can get T equals LN two over R and that's going to be the time. So ln2 over r is going to be the time to double whenever you have an account being compounded continuously. This is actually a general formula, by the way. So there are some uh, calculus books where they actually have this in a list of formulas that they have. And a very similar formula will hold true for other kinds of multiplication factors. So for example, if someone wanted to find what is the time to triple in value? It's going to be ln3 over r. What is the time to quadruple in value? It's going to be ln4 over r, et cetera. This is actually something, whenever you just have something growing, you're not affecting it uh, by some external means. You're not withdrawing or you're not depositing or you're not doing anything else. You just have it sit there and it's just growing on its own. If it's being compounded continuously, the time uh, to double is going to be ln2 over r, where r is the interest rate. So that, that was actually part A. Part B, determine T if R is 7%. So here, this is just going to be us plugging in 7%. And I mean, you won't really know what this is. That, that would be the answer if this was being asked in a test, but let's just actually figure out what that is. Uh, more specifically, or in a nicer form. Uh, ln of two divided by 0 0.07. So, so that is about, I just dropped my pencil. That is 9.9 .9 years. So if an account that is compounded continuously could actually exist uh, and you deposited some money into this account and it's growing at a 7% annual interest rate, in, 10, in a little under 10 years, your money will double. So if you had deposited $1,000, it'll take 10 years. Even if you do nothing, uh, in 10 years time, it's going to double to $2,000. If you deposited 100,000, it would double to 200,000 in 10 years. Um, so, yeah, that's that. That would be your answer here. Uh, let's see, see, find the rate of return that must be achieved as the initial investment is to double in eight years. So we want the initial investment to double in eight years. So here for C, we want T to be eight years. 
and this is asked, what is, what is R, right? So if you want to find an investment in this scenario that will actually double your money in eight years, um, what must the interest rate be? What interest rate should you achieve? Um, then this means that eight should be equal to LN2 over R, and you can solve for R. It's going to be LN2 over eight. That's that. Um, this, by the way, is roughly, let me actually do that. So it's a little over 8%. This must be 0 0.0866. So your R should be around 8.66%. Now, of course, for you, if you're typing something in this class, you would be, just leave it as LN2 over eight because generally you're not supposed to be using calculators, so you won't know what the decimal answer is. So that's that. Okay, now let's look at D. And D, So D, now uh, you guys chime in. How would you do part D? The thing about part D. So invest $1,000 initially, and we have another $500 being invested every year. How long before the balance reaches 55,000? And what are we doing here? So here, it doesn't really say if we want 7%. Let's, let's do the 7% value for R. It's the same as population. Well, you tell me, how would you set this up? So uh, begin the problem. So call S to be the current balance. Set up the, set up the problem, uh, tell me how to solve it. Okay, so. So part D is like, it's, it's actually kind of a full problem in its own. I could have said something like the following. I could have just started off with a sentence that says, assume that there's an account that is being compounded continuously. If $1,000 is initially invested and another $500 is invested every year at an annual interest rate of 7%, how long before the balance reaches 55,000? This could be a whole problem on its own, on a test or a quiz, okay? Now, assuming that that was the question, how would you solve this problem? Give me the setup. Tell me how to solve it. Someone like lead us through this, this entire problem. It's kind of putting together a lot of ideas that we spoke about. Okay. So, you gave me the differential equation. S prime equals 0.07S. This should be a point here. Uh, plus 500, right, that's the ODE. Now, what's the initial condition? Because you, you always want to talk about that. What is the initial condition? Yeah, we are using little t to be years. What's the initial condition here? Right, initial condition is the equation S of zero is 1,000. So, this here is the ODE that describes the situation. This here is called the initial condition. 
So there was a point on, a, on the quiz where I asked this, and there were actually several people who uh, kind of messed this up with the, the population question where I asked you, what is the ODE? Enter it here. What is the initial condition? Enter it here. And a lot of people were confused, it seems, about that. So the ODE is the differential equation that would describe the situation. The initial condition is the equation that tells you what the value of the uh, dependent variable is at a certain point. And these guys are both equations. You have to write out the entire equation as the answer. Okay, so that's how we'd start. So we know that that's, that's ultimately what we need to solve to be able to talk about this uh, question here. So how do I continue? How do I finish this up? And yeah, this is actually very similar. It's almost, uh, mechanically speaking, it's exactly the kind of process you would go through to solve the last question on the quiz. So when I posted the quiz answers on the class website, you're gonna see, hopefully by now you'll see how we actually got to that answer. So, so what are we doing here? Separate the variables, right? So it turns out that S prime, remember this is just, uh, this is actually just DS DT. So I can have separate the DS, I can divide by that entire side. And on this side now, I would just have the DT. Then I'm going to integrate both sides. And what is the integral of the left side? Integral of the left side. Right you're gonna get uh, one over 0 0.07, which is the same as seven over 100, ln of uh, 0 0.07 s plus 500. This side is gonna be t plus a constant. So this is going to mean that you have ln 0 0.07 s plus 500 equals 0 0.07 t. This is going to mean 0 0.07s plus 500 is equal to a constant times e to the 0 0.07t. And so this means that your s is going to be c e to the 0 0.07t minus 500. And then this here is 7 over 100. So I'm going to multiply by. 100 over seven. Now we can apply the initial condition. This means I have a thousand on this side whenever my T is zero on that side. So this would mean 7,000 over 100 plus 500 is going to be equal to the C. So that is 570 is going to be C. And then I would go back, plug that into my S of T. So my S of T says it's 100 over seven. My C is 570 E the point zero seven T minus 500. All right, and here you can actually do a quick check in your head. Um, so you don't need to do this, but check. If you plug in T equals zero, then what you would have is that you'd have S of zero would be equal to 100 over seven in parentheses, 570 minus 500. That's 100 over seven times 70. This is just 100 times 10 and you get a thousand as you expected or that's what you should get. So 
at first glance, this does work out. So of course, there's a lot of arithmetic happening here. So you could have made a mistake at some point. It's always nice that once you get the final answer, just do a quick check in your head. You don't really need to write this out on paper uh, to show the work, but um, just do a little quick check and say, yeah, this, this kind of makes sense. It's kind of feasible, right? Just to kind of uh, reduce the possibility that you made a mistake. Okay, so this is a function that is going to describe the value of this particular account under these conditions at time t. And the question says, how long before the balance reaches 55,000? At this point, at this point, this is just algebra. All the differential equations part of the, it's done. So when will we have 55,000? Now, of course, 55,000, here's the S value. So for this, uh, we are just going to plug in the S value equals 55,000. And then solve for T, that's all that stuff. This means I take 55,000, multiply by seven over 100, add 500 to that, and divide by 570, and that is going to leave me with e to the point zero seven t. Okay, so I got rid of this, multiply by seven over 100, then I'm left with this, add the 500, then I'm going to divide by the coefficient of E, which is the 570. And this is going to reduce because this and that goes into that and that. So we have 550 uh, times seven, and that's going to be, I think, 3850 plus 500 over 570. And so that's going to be 4350 over 570. reduce that. I won't go any further than that though. So now you just ln this 4, 3, 5 over 57 equals 0 0.07t. And so your t is going to be equal to ln of 4, 3, 5 over 57 divided by 0 0.07. Or you can write it as uh, One hundred over seven LN of four thirty-five over fifty-seven. And that's your answer. Okay. So hopefully that wasn't too bad. It seems like a long thing to write out, but if you know what you're doing, this should be a relatively quick problem to get through. If you think things are long to write out here, don't worry. We're eventually going to get to a point where these problems are going to get uh, very long. <laughs> so you, you, you guys have seen nothing yet. Okay, so um, your algebra skills being on point is going to be very important. Just, just in, in general, paying attention to detail is going to be very important because as you'll see in the future, a lot of these problems, they will get involved, which is why it's very, important that you know the general methods, you know the general formulas, you know the general rules, because they're going to be your guides that are going to lead you through the minutia of actually solving all these problems and going through all the actual calculations. Okay? So that's a, a part of it. But yeah, that's going to, that's going to be the time. And I don't know, do I want to actually try this in a calculator? Okay, LN 
of 435 divided by 57. times 100 divided by 7. So it'll take roughly 30 years. OK, that's interesting. And so whenever you guys are reading those like uh, financial blogs or whatever, and they're like, oh, well, if you invested this amount of money in the stock market, you would have blah, 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 right? This is, this is well, this is not exactly, because you don't really assume it's being compounded continuously. Um, but um, this is kind of like the calculations that people would have done. And so you can realize that, okay, if the stock market was returning 7% and you put in $1,000, then leave that alone for 30 years and you're going to have somewhere around 55,000. Of course, it's going to be less than that. It's going to be a little bit less than that because you would really calculate the compounding being done yearly, but uh, you kind of get the idea. So compounding continuously, again, in reality, it can never actually happen. However, we kind of think of this as sort of you know, a worst case scenario. What's the most that could possibly ever happen in reality? It's definitely going to be less than this, but this is going to be like the ceiling, right? So getting 55,000 from a thousand dollar investment 30 years ago is the most you could possibly expect. Chances are you're going to get something a little bit less, a couple thousand less. But yeah, that's just that one application. And again, we, we spoke about these, these sort of applications already. So Nothing much else to say there. What we're going to do now is one final problem. And move on to the next section, which is going to be cool, I think. So here's a word problem. Finish up the application section. So it's a murder case. All right. So body was found. Uh, we know that the room is temperature conditioned. It's always 60 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. According to the police report, uh, the body was found with a knife in his hand and the cause of death was determined to be fatal stabbing. Okay, so from the looks of it, it starts to look like a suicide. Okay, so the police report reveals that the corpse was 80 degrees Fahrenheit when found just after midnight. So the cops were, uh, responded to this call, happened, they got there just after midnight. Um, they started investigating, you know, they're taking the temperature of the body, they're looking for the fingerprints and all that stuff. They found the temperature of the body was 80 degrees Fahrenheit at this point, at around midnight. Later on, they go again and they're doing more measurements. Maybe one of the, the coroners came in late or whatever. Uh, he measured it to be 75 degrees Fahrenheit two hours later. Now, the main suspect claims that, uh, so, you know, maybe one of the neighbors told the cops, like, you know what, he, he was fighting with the person down the hall. And they go and they question him and like, you know, we, we, you know, this person you were seen fighting with and we know that you have a problem with them. They were found dead in their apartment last night. Uh, well, what do you have to say for yourself? We're checking out um, all suspects. And he's like, no, I, I couldn't have done it. I was at, at work until like 8 p.m., right? So I got home late last night and, you know, it couldn't have been me, right? So now the police turn to you right? Because this is like a, a CBS TV show or, or whatever. So you're a mathematician by day and crime solver by night, right? You need to help them figure out what's going on. Uh, do you buy the suspect's alibi? And can you actually think, well, does the timing work out? You know, if, he, if, he, if anything happened between the hours of 8 p.m. and 12 p.m., does the timing actually work out for this situation based on the measurements that the investigators were taking, right? So that's just a random problem because when, when you see all these problems about Newton schooling, it's normally a problem like, oh, there's a cup of tea on a table and someone measured it to find it this thing. And it's like, no, what? You're gonna measure a cup of tea? And I mean, this situation isn't as realistic, but at least it's a little bit more exciting. So and you should have seen this question before. <laughs> uh, way back when uh, I had a question like this, it was even crazier, but okay. So here, here are the facts, right? And obviously temperature is a big deal here. 
And I also gave you that uh, the average temperature is around 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit for a human being. Um, and it's different for every human being, but that's generally taken as the ballpark figure for the average body temperature of a living adult, okay? So the temperature is how we're going to solve this. You're, you're seeing all these temperature measurements. You know that, hey, the body was this temperature when it's found. It was this temperature two hours later. You know that this is supposed to be the temperature it had to start at if the person was alive. And then you also know that the body was found in a room that is 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So now you know the surrounding temperature, you know the temperature of the environment, and you know a couple of values for the temperature of the object, in this case, the body of the person, uh, was at two points in time. So now what we're going to do is we're going to try to figure this out. And it turns out a problem like this, you can actually solve this based on Newton's cooling law. So remember Isaac Newton discovered uh, how objects change their temperature. In general, an object will change its temperature to match the temperature of its surroundings. And of course, there are laws of thermodynamics that tell you heat trans uh, travels from places where they're hotter to places where they're colder. So if the body is warmer than the temperature of the environment, heat will leave the body. And this is why a uh, AC works, right? When you feel hot and you turn on the AC, it makes the room colder than your body and heat will transfer from your body into the room. And then the room has to keep working to keep that cool. And that's how you get cooler, okay? So if you have an object that is hotter than the surrounding, the object will lose heat to the surrounding. And eventually, it will go to a point where both things are going to be um, the same temperature, right? Now, of course, in your body, your body creates heat. So this, this, doesn't, this is why you don't get super cold like your AC and die because your body actually runs its metabolism and it, it's, a, it's running a machinery to keep you warm. Uh, so, okay, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here. All right, so if the object is colder than the surrounding temperature, the environment is going to transfer heat to the object and then the temperature of the object is going to rise. And this is why when we had Newton's cooling, we had that negative sign to account for that situation. Um, and we know that Newton's cooling, uh, that big T prime is equal to minus K, and that minus K is because of what I mentioned before, of the current temperature minus the temperature of the surrounding, T ambient. Notice that if this big T is larger than T ambient, then this is going to be positive, right? Now, if the temperature of the object is larger than the temperature of the surrounding, meaning it's hotter, then its temperature is going to decrease to match the temperature of the surrounding. And that's why this negative sign here is going to make it decrease. Conversely, if the temperature of the object is actually smaller than the temperature of the surrounding, meaning it's colder, then heat is going to transfer from the surrounding to the object, and it's going to start heating up. In other words, this is going to be negative, and then when you multiply by this negative, it's going to turn this temperature change positive, right? And so this is Newton's cooling. That's why the law is written that way. But Newton figured out that the rate of change of temperature is always proportional to the difference in temperature between an object and its surroundings. So the bigger the gap between the temperature of the object and the temperature of the surroundings, the faster the temperature change will move to make these guys match. For a smaller gap, the temperature change will uh, drop slower, right? This is why when, whenever you take something like that's cold, like uh, you're, you're going to start cooking meat or something and you throw it in a pot, it goes crazy for the first, uh, the first few seconds that you throw it in because there's a, a, a rapid temperature change. And then eventually it starts to simmer and it slows down because the temperature starts changing slower uh, as you go on, right? So Newton's cooling models that, it turns out that a first order differential equation models that situation. And Newton actually sat down with a pen and paper and figured this out, right? He just take, took a bunch of measurements, he mapped the temperature change, and he realized, hey, this guy is always proportional. Now the constant of proportionality will change from object to object. This K here usually has to be, uh, has to do with the material of the object right, and all that good stuff. But 
pretty much all objects will obey this rule um, to some degree. Okay, so that is Newton's cooling law. Now, whenever you want to track temperature, it's often a very convenient and a very useful differential equation to use. And that's what we're going to use here. So a problem like this, whenever you see a problem about temperature, where temperature is kind of the main thing, you can all, almost as always assume that Newton's cooling law is going to be that the law you're expected to use. Okay. And these are the, and, and this coupling with the other two are the three main applications of first order differential equation that we see in this class. Um, so you need to know how to do mixture problems, how to do uh, population and compounding continuously problems, and you need to know how to do Newton's cooling temperature problems. Of the three, the mixture problems is the most common one to ask about, but you do need to know the other two because I do see them pop up from time to time on department finals and things of that sort, which you guys are getting a department final. I'm not writing your final. Okay, so that is going to be the equation that we're going to use. And now let's actually find the important numbers. So normally what you will want to do, normally what you're going to need is you should know about the temperature at two different values. And why do you need two different points? Because there are two unknowns that are going to be here. Your, the K first is going to be unknown, as well as the constant of proportionality is going to be unknown. So the constant of integration, once you start solving this, you get another constant of integration. So you're gonna have two unknowns floating about, and that's why you need actually two points of reference. So we need that, um, and we need to know the surrounding temperature, which again, you can measure that with a thermometer or a thermostat or whatever. So here what we know is that T equals the time, uh, let's, let's measure it in hours, uh, since midnight. Okay, so that means uh, we know what T of zero is. T of zero is going to be the temperature that, at which the body was found, that's 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And we know what it is, it says two hours later. So T of two is going to be 75. So in that time, it dropped by five degrees Fahrenheit. Um, we also know the surrounding temperature. This is 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, that's written here. And so this would mean that my T prime is equals to minus K times T minus 60. Now it turns out that this is a first order differential equation. More than that, it is a separable first order differential equation. So don't mix up the little t and the big T. Go through, you'll integrate both sides. This side you'll get ln of absolute value. This side you get minus kt plus constant. Then you would have t equals, this would be a constant c to the minus kt, and then you'll add 60. And at this point, notice that we have two unknowns. So we'll need two points of reference. Here, I know that T of zero is equal to 80. So this means I have 80 when T equals zero. So this means that C is going to be 20. So that's my C value. And also, now I know that T of two is 75 which means that 75 is going to be, I'm gonna plug in the C, C is 20. This happens when T is two plus 60. So this means that 15 is equal to 20E to the minus two K. And this means that three fourths 
is equal to e to the minus 2k. This means that ln of 3 fourths is minus 2k. And so that means that uh, minus k is equal to 1 half ln of 3 fourths. And so now I can go back and I can find the original value. And so this here is k. Where were we? Here. So we're going to fill in the c and the minus k. So the C we saw was uh, 20. And then the minus K is 1 half ln 3 over 4. Now let me write this actually a little bigger. So that function actually describes the temperature of the body at time t, where t is measured in hours since midnight. Okay, so now going back to the question. So I now have a function that's going to measure the temperature. Um, how do you think we can figure out? So the goal here would be to figure out when was the person actually last alive? How do you think we can figure that out? Right, set t equals 98.6, right? So here, if I set this to be 98.6, this is t when person was alive. And I'm just going to solve for the time. So this is going to be 38.6 equals 20 e to that whole thing. So this is going to mean 38.6 over 20. And I'm going to take ln of this guy. And that's going to be 1 half ln of 3 over 4 t. And so this means that my t is going to be 2 ln, 38.6 over 20, divided by ln of 3 over 4. Now this is roughly, uh, let me actually do that. Because you know, it's very, it's very important that we can solve this crime. 38.6 divided by 20, close parentheses, divided by ln of three divided by four. So this here is roughly minus 4.57 hours. So how you want to think of this is it's 4.57 hours before midnight. Which means uh, time of death. When it was roughly around 7.30 p.m.
So one thing we do know is that if this person was correct in that they were at work until 8 p.m., they could not have personally have done it. It's not to say that they can, can get someone else to do it, but we know that this person, if we can verify that they were at work until 8 p.m., uh, they are not physically themselves the murderer. And that is a calculation that you can do. And, and this calculation can actually work in this real-time scenario. People actually figure out the time of death by methods like this, just checking the temperature. Now, I, you're not going to see a coroner that's going through and actually solving differential equations while he's on the spot on the job. Uh, but the machinery that he has is going to be doing these sort of calculations inside it. Right? So sometimes you're seeing... There are, there, there are a lot of things like this. Like there are times when you're seeing someone taking measurements and then their machine tells them, oh, this is what happened, right? This is the time of death, or this was that when that happened, and this was that happened. And a lot of times, a differential equation is what's used in the background. Because a differential equation is just talking about the rate of change of something. And rate of change of time, rate of change of temperature, rate of change. There are so many things you can get by just measuring the rate of change. It's not even funny, right? Like if you have like a, when your computer is, uh, when you're, when the cops are using this speed gun to actually catch your time, like the speed gun is literally solving a differential equation to see how fast they're going. You know what I mean? So like these guys are happening, we use them all over the place. You'd be surprised, okay? So by just getting the, this situation here, you can read this situation and you can guess pretty much when, when the time of death was. You can use a differential equation to figure that out. And again, not a complicated differential equation. A first order separable differential equation can help you out with that. This is Newton's cooling law. It's a very important law. Um, and it helps us to talk about the rate of change of temperature. And yes, that is cool, Kevin. So that was the last ex uh, example I wanted to give you here for this section. So that's applications. So by far, the mixer problems are the ones that I think you should definitely know. Uh, and there's a small chance that you might have to do some of these guys. I'll definitely quiz you on them just in case, but on your final, chances are the, the mixer problem is the one that you would get and the Newton's cooling problem or the other problems. There's a smaller chance that you would get them. But of course, I'm gonna quiz you on all of them to make sure that you know <laughs> you know how to do all of them. Yeah, but that's this guy. So that was just a small detour to talk about some applications of ODEs. This is some models that we can do with first order ODEs to show you that even at this point in the textbook, even at this early chapter, in this early spot, there's still a lot of real world applications for the things that we're studying. The next thing I want to talk about is a whole different kind of equation called an exact equation and their integrating factors. I don't know if I'm gonna to get to the integrating factor, which I, I put in a whole other section, um, but uh, we're going to talk about exact equations and how to actually solve them. This is actually another very important type of differential equation. Um, has anyone here taken 392 or maybe 213, math 213 or math 392? Is there anyone who took either one of those classes? Okay, Rebecca. So you're, you're going to notice a pattern here that's going to be very similar to something. Is there anyone else? Okay, so we have a couple people, maybe. 213, you'd all also see it there. Okay, yeah. So this is going to be very similar to, remember back in 392 or 213, this will be helpful for the people who have taken uh, those classes before. This might actually help you uh, get through this kind of problem easier. So there was a point in both of these classes where you had something that was called a conservative vector field. And specifically, I'm going to be referring to the two-dimensional conservative vector field here. So there was a check that you could do that can determine whether a vector field, a two-dimensional vector field was conservative or not. And this was just a measure of that it conserves work 
right? So the work to move between any two points to be to move between two points in that vector field will be the same regardless of the path taken to go from one point to the other. Okay, so that was a way that you could def uh, define a certain conservative vector field, but you could also define it based on an equation, right? So it's a vector that looks like p comma q in the sharp parentheses, where the partial differential, the partial derivative of p with respect to y was equal to the partial derivative of q with respect to x, and these guys were continuously differentiable on the region that you cared about. Okay, then we found through the fundamental theorem of line integrals that you could actually solve, you could actually find the work done in such a situation without actually doing a line integral. You could actually do it via plugging in points into something called a potential function, or in this specific case, a scalar potential function, okay? Now, the process by which you found that potential function is literally going to be the process that we are going to use to solve differential equations of this type that I'm about to talk about. So if you do remember 213 or 392, you already have a leg up here. For the rest of you though, um, it's not gonna be that bad uh, once you can identify it. So I wouldn't worry too much, but it might be helpful to some people that, hey, this is something you've seen before. So, you know, you kind of know what the deal is, but let's actually get into that. It turns out that a very similar process can be used to solve certain kinds of differential equations. And these kinds of differential equations are ones that we call exact differential equations. The same kind of process that you use to find a two-dimensional, uh, to find the scalar potential function of a two-dimensional vector field is going to be the, the process that we use to solve these guys. So these are, we're gonna talk about exact differential equations, okay? So these guys are a, a first, a, as a type of first order ODEs. And we're gonna solve them based on some pattern that we would have seen in multivariable calculus. So this is like in a Calc 3 class, you will see something like this, right? This is the chain rule from multivariable calculus. If you have a level curve, f of x, y equals c, then, you can actually find dy dx by just going through and differentiating both sides and you can apply this formula. This is applying the chain rule. Of course, you can rewrite it like this if you were to, uh, because your dx's will cancel. You can actually cancel the dx's and write it like that. So then that leads to that. And I can also uh, multiply both sides. If I multiply both sides by dx, multiply, both sides by dx, then it would lead to this version here, okay? So I can start out with a level curve. I can go through and find y prime by applying the chain rule. By applying the chain rule, we can get one of these two guys here. So these are the guys I want you to focus on. Here's what I want you to notice. Those two guys are differential equations. This is an equation with a derivative in it. So it involves a function and its derivatives, right? So these guys are differential equations, right? And notice what you've just seen. We know where these guys came from. We started here with the f of x, y equals c. And it turns out that that is connected to this differential equation here, which means we can go the other way. So we realize here, This leads to a differential equation. Which means we can solve an ODE that looks like this by bringing it back to that original equation, the, the original function here. This means that your f of x comma y equals c is the solution, right? And we define that. Remember what the solution of an ODE is, right? It is just some equation that does not involve derivatives that connects the, variable, the, the dependent and independent variables in such a way that the differential equation is satisfied at the same time. So these two equations are going to be true always at the same time. However, this one down here has derivatives in it, and this one up here does not, right? So that is a the solution to a differential equation by definition. And that, that was another issue that a bunch of people made on the quiz as well. 
there were times when I asked you to find the solution to a differential equation and you didn't list an equation. Like you listed like maybe the right side of the equation or one part of the equation. The solution to a differential equation is an entire equation. Um, and you can't always isolate the dependent variable, but the entire equation is going to be the solution. It's very important that you know that. So it turns out that this equation, starting with the f of x comma y equals c, we can lead to this differential equation, which is another way of saying that the solution to this differential equation is the equation f of x, y equals c, right? Going by the definition of the differential equation and its solution, that must be true. Okay, so what does this mean for us? Just to summarize, okay? Um, if we have an ODE of this form, then its solution is of this form. That's the main takeaway that I want you to get here. So that, that's the thing that I want you to be aware of. If you're looking at a differential equation that looks like this form, then you'll automatically know what form the solution has to be in. And this kind of differential equation, this kind of differential equation specifically, this guy here, this is called an exact differential equation. And I believe it's I, I don't remember where the name coming from. I looked this up once. I think it's from actually a physics context because it deals with exact functions from physics uh, for something. I, I don't remember, but um, it's called an exact differential equation. Okay, so let's actually jump into an example. Those were the definitions. Let's actually do an example. For example, here is a differential equation. Boom, right here. Okay, so that's a differential equation. That's, I don't know why I highlighted that. Here is a differential equation, just made it bigger. Okay. And consider the level curve, this, f of x, y equals that guy equals c. So this is, this is the level curve I want you to consider. And consider, is of course the scariest word in all of mathematics. Whenever your math book says consider, you kind of know that someone's going to just pull something out of a hat that comes from nowhere and you're going to like, what, how did they get that? Right? So consider, it's very scary. Okay, so we have a differential equation here and I want you to consider this level curve. And we're going to say, find the first order partials of the left side. Okay, all right, okay, that's fine. So. Here, let, let's actually do that. Let's follow the, the, the thing here. So f of x, y equals x squared, y squared over two plus x squared over two plus x. Now it says find the first order partials, all right? So this means find the partial with respect to x. Um, let's make sure that we know how to do this. Someone tell me what the partial with respect to x is. It's like we, we need to know how to do that. Like I'm assuming everyone knows how to find partial derivatives. How do we find the partial derivatives with respect to x? What would that look like here? All right, so 2xy squared over 2, which I mean, you can cancel the 2s, so you'll just get xy squared. And then you have plus x plus one, okay? Plus x plus one. What would be the partial with respect to y? All right, x squared y. Now here's something I want you to notice. Notice, that this guy here is actually the first part here. Also notice that this guy here is actually this part here.
Do you notice that? Which means the above ODE is of the form partial with respect to x dx plus partial with respect to y dy equals zero. And so that means this level curve that we just were asked to consider is the solution. This means x squared y squared over two plus x squared over two plus x equals c is the solution. All right, and that's it, great. Thanks for coming everybody. Oh, no, I'm kidding. I'm gonna have to show you how would someone find that, right? Without the consider, like how, how would you know if I gave you this, how would you figure out that that is the particular function that you need to solve the equation? So that's what we're going to look at, right? So yeah, this is the definition of an exact equation. This is just to describe what I just showed you guys. And I'm going to use the notation now that looks more like what your textbook uses. So an exact differential equation, just to, to recap, and, and this is a definition, so this, this is actually somewhat important. You should actually know this. Let me... Uh, although I think I do define this later on. If not, I'll come back and box that. So here's what we, I want you to take away, okay? And I'm going to refine this a little bit soon. An exact differential equation is one of this form. So it's going to look like some function of x and y, which we call big M times dx, plus some function of n, x and y, which we call big N times dy. Of course, uh, you can also rewrite this in another way, or it looks like M plus N times y prime equals zero, right? So by just dividing through by dx, you can get it into this second form, okay? Now, if it's the case that m is the partial derivative of some function with respect to x, and it's the case that n is some partial derivative of some function with respect to y, then the above differential equation is what we call an exact differential equation. And if we can determine the function f, that the m is the partial with respect to x of that guy, and the n is the partial with respect to y of that guy, we will be able to determine the solution to the differential equation. Now, how do we go about doing this? Well, there's another theorem that you learned called Clairaut's theorem uh, in multivariable calculus, which tells you that if, you're, if your functions are continuously differentiable, means their derivatives, their partial derivatives are continuous on the region of consideration, then the order of partial derivatives does not matter. So this means that the partial of f with respect to x then with respect to y is the same as the partial derivative with respect to y then with respect to x. What does that mean? Well, if I take the partial of m with respect to y, right? remember the m is f sub x. So the partial of m with respect to y is going to be the partial of f, it's going to be f sub x times y. And the partial of n with respect to x is actually going to be f sub y times x. Clairaut's theorem tells us that these guys are the same. And so m sub y is going to be m sub x. So you look at a differential equation like this, you notice that my equals next, and boom, you're looking at an exact differential equation. So this is going to be a criteria that you're going to check to know that you're looking at an exact differential equation. This is kind of like the rule back in 213 or 392, where they said you have to check if p sub y is equal to q sub x. It's the same thing, except in your textbook, they use m and n instead of p and q, right? But that's the same thing. Okay, so that's how we can determine that something is an exact equation. I know we're looking at it, and we'll do some examples of this later. Okay, now, how do you go about finding the f is the question. How do you actually go about finding the solution? Well, if your m is f sub x, then that means that your f has to be the integral of m with respect to x. That seems to make sense, right? Now, of course, here you're going to have an arbitrary constant coming into play. And if your m, n is in Nancy, is f with sub y, then your f should be the integral of n with respect to y. 
And so that idea, the fact that we can figure out what the MN, uh, what the F is via integration, leads us to two main methods. Method one and method two. Now, method one is the one that I prefer and would recommend. I think it's a lot easier. Method two is the method that is more traditionally taught. Um, chances are, if you did this in 213 or 392, and even in your textbook, method two is the one that is taught in the textbook for this class. For some reason, that's the one that most people go towards. However, it's actually more complicated than the first method. So um, let's actually, I'm going to show you to how to go through these methods in order to find, um, in order to find the uh, equation, in order to find the solution. And by the way, uh, I do mention here that these methods can be extended to more variables. What I mean by that is, um, i.e., uh, for example, if we had, um, say, m times dx plus n times dy plus, I don't know, q times dz equals zero, then uh, you would be able to figure out that your f must be equal to the integral of m with respect to x, your f is also going to be the integral of n with respect to y, and your f is going to be the integral of q with respect to z, provided a similar criteria holds. So if you have a three-dimensional vector field and you want to find the conservative vector function, these are equations that can be very useful. Also, and, and for method two, you could actually just start with one function, say the f sub x, integrate to get the f, differentiate to get the fy, integrate to get the f, differentiate to get the fz, integrate again to get the f. So the cycle, as long as you go through all partial derivatives, jumping back to the original function in between them and picking up clues, you can actually do that. So here is this, the, the cycle for a two-dimensional thing where only x and y are the variable. But if you have three, you can just extend the cycle. It extends very naturally. Now for us, we're only going to be dealing with a two-dimensional case, so you don't have to worry, but you might have other examples and other situations where you have a three-dimensional case or a four-dimensional case. And what I'm going to tell you extends very naturally in these situations. Okay, so let's actually illustrate. I'm going to illustrate both methods with this differential equation, the one that was given above. I'm going to show you how I would actually solve this differential equation. So here, so first thing I would do is I would note, 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 in this case, m is equal to x y squared plus x plus one, and my n is equal to x squared y. This means that my partial with respect to y is gonna be two x y, and if I take next, partial with respect to x, I would get 2xy. Notice that these are equal. That means what I'm looking at is an exact differential equation. So if this guy showed up on a quiz, you could do this little examination that I did here, and you'd realize, oh, I'm looking at an exact differential equation right now, okay? So now, how would I go about solving the differential equation? So let me show you method one, what method one would look like. Here's what method one would look like. I know the solution is f of x comma y equals c. And I know where my f is going to be the integral of m with respect to x. So I'm literally going to take the integral of x, y squared plus x plus one with respect to x. I'm going to integrate that. So this is going to be x squared, y squared over two plus x squared over two plus x. Uh, and then I'm going to be left over here with a constant. Now the constant in this case, you have to realize 
is actually going to be some other function. It's going to be some constant that is potentially a function of y. Why? Well, if you had a function of y here and you differentiated with respect to x, that entire function would disappear. So your constant of integration here is actually a function. Now, for this method, you don't actually need to worry about that, and I'm, I'm going to explain why later on. So the constant of integration is a function. However, we can actually ignore this constant, and I'll explain why later. Now, also, we know that your f must be the integral of n with respect to y. So I go through, and I take the n, which is x squared y, dy, and I integrate that. Integrating this with respect to y, I get y squared over 2, plus some other constant, which is potentially a function of x. Because now, if I differentiate that with respect to y, the dx is going to go to 0, and I'd be left over with x squared y. So now, here's how we put together the solution. So here, what I'm going to say, ignore the arbitrary constants. And sum the unique functions that appear. This is your f. Now, technically, your f, this is going to be your f of x, y plus c. But the plus c, we're going to move to the right side of the equation anyway. Now, what do I mean by the unique function that appeared? Meaning only sum anything once, only sum any function that shows up. once. All right, so don't like double dip or anything. So we're going to look at all the functions that appear. So if I look in this situation, when I did this integration, x squared y squared over 2 appears, x squared over 2 appears, x appears. If I look down here, what else appears? Well, I have x squared y squared over 2, but that I already accounted for from the first one, so this one I'm going to ignore, right? This one already accounted for. So literally what I'm going to do with my f is just write down all the functions that show up and add them together. So this means that my, um, maybe I should write this in another color because this isn't going to be a part of the answer. This means that my f of x, y is going to be x squared, y squared over 2 plus x squared over 2 plus x, now plus a constant. And now, this means that your solution is going to be that function equals a constant. And I can tell you right now, a lot of students mess up here because they'd write this as the solution or sometimes they write f equals this as the solution, and that's incorrect. The solution is in this form. You take the variable part and you equal it to c. And why? Because of what we discussed up here. f of x equals c, f of x y equals c is what the solution is going to look like. That's what the solution has to look like. So your solution is going to look like this. Now, if you look at this, and you looked at the level curve that we asked you to consider from earlier, this, you'll notice that it's the same thing, right? And that's where this guy came from. So if you notice that something is a exact differential equation, meaning you can do this check, my equals next, what it means then is you can integrate the dx part with respect to x, integrate the dy part with respect to y, add together all the unique functions that appear, set that equal to c, 
and that's your answer. And, and that's, that's it, that's the answer, All right? So it's just, you do two integrals. Now we're gonna do another, uh, we're gonna do a few more examples of this, but that's in the process in a nutshell. Now, what would method two look like? Now, chances are method two is what a lot of you learned, but those, some of you might have seen method one. Did, did anyone see method one when solving for conservative vector fields? Just integrate the components. Okay, awesome, good. <laughs> we were taught method two, but everyone did method one. Yeah, so method one is like, <laughs> method one is the better way to do it. Um, but a lot of people are uncomfortable with it because they kind of ignore these guys. And I think they're just afraid of students asking questions like, well, why did you ignore those guys? The idea is any part of a function that was missing here will actually show up here. So if there was a function purely of y, he would disappear in the m section, but he would actually appear in the n section. And so the reason why we're allowed to ignore the constants here is because any guy that one guy misses, it will be picked up in the other guy. And so we'll actually see that in some future examples, right? But we can essentially ignore these guys and it just, it doesn't sound very mathematically rig rigorous to say that, ah, oh, just ignore it, it's not important. It sounds much more like what a physicist would say. Oh, we can just pretend that's a constant. Pretend the cow is a sphere, it's fine. And it's on a frictionless surface. Yeah, it'll work out. Right? Math people don't like saying things like that. So, so I guess traditionally, uh, we like to actually keep track of everything and you know, very neat bookkeeping. Okay, so here's method two, which is what you were, chances are were taught. Now, if you do, I'm just going to go over this method just in case someone wants to do it that way. They learned it this way, they like it that way. They don't want to do anything different. So I'm just going to review that method here just for that. But even me personally, whenever I'm solving a, a, an exact differential equation in class, I'm going to do method one. Um, but you can follow along with method two. So just to remind you of what method two would look like. So again, here's the differential equation. I'm going to show you what method two would look like. So again, first, you would check that it's exact. I mean, we're in the exact equation section, so you know it's exact, but in general, on a quiz, like I'm not going to tell you that an equation is exact. You will have a variety of equations on one piece of paper, and you have to figure out, oh, this one is exact, this one is first order linear, that one is homogeneous. So you do have to do a check that it is, ex it, it, it is exact, okay? Now, we already did the check earlier, so let's actually jump into finding the solution. Here's what we, we're going to do. So this says you would go through the cycle. You start with one of the partials. So in this case, that's going to be like M. And you kind of run through a cycle where you cycle through all the partials and the original function. So you're gonna go from F sub X, you're going to integrate to F, get to F. You're going to do some comparison to figure out what the arbitrary constants are. Then you're going to differentiate to get to Y. Uh, pick up the arbitrary constants, then you're going to integrate back to get to F. Once you go through all partial derivatives, this guy here is going to be your N, then by the time you get here, your, your full F will show up here. So let's see what that's going to look like. So we have this, I checked that it's exact. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with F sub X f sub x is equal to this. I am going to integrate to get to f. So I integrate this with respect to x to get to f. So integrate f sub x dx. This is going to give me x squared y squared over 2 plus x squared over 2 plus x plus some constant that's potentially a function of y. Then I'm going to differentiate to get to y. So this is going to be the partial with respect to y of the f that was above. Okay, so I started with f sub x. 
I integrate to get to F. Now I'm going to differentiate to get to Y. So I'm doing both integrals and derivatives in this process. So I differentiate the above line and I would get X squared Y plus C prime of Y. And I know that this is equal to N. And my N is actually just X squared Y. So this allows me to figure out that my C prime of Y must be zero, which means that my C of Y is just the integral of zero, which is just some constant, right? That doesn't depend on either variable. It's just, it's literally just a number. So now I'm going to go back and I'm going to plug that back in to find the F. So I'm going to go back and plug in, uh, plug in the C. So I go back to F, plug in the C. So this is X squared, Y squared over two plus X squared over two plus X plus a constant. So that's our F. And that means uh, we know what the solution must look like. This means that the solution to our differential equation is going to be X squared, Y squared over two plus X squared over two plus X equals constant. And that's method two. So for method two, you start by integrating, then you differentiate, then you compare to figure out what the arbitrary constant is. Then you go back to the original F that you got first and you plug in what the arbitrary constant was. And once you have that is your full F, you can now write down the solution. Right? Yeah, so method one is definitely, it's more straightforward because you don't need to integrate and differentiate and compare and then integrate and differentiate and compare, which for more variables, you'll keep going through that. Method one just says, no, just integrate each component with respect to the variable for that component. Combine everybody, that's your answer, right? So integrate the dx part with respect to x, integrate the dy part with respect to y, add up all the unique functions that appear, that's your f, okay? So, but method two is like that, some people might, have done this way. And um, in, in my experience, you have a lot of students who are just like, I learned it this way, I'm always gonna do it that way. So if you like that way, do it that way. But uh, personally, I like method one. And I will pretty much always do method one. So method one is just integrate each component with respect to its respective variable, add up, add, add up all the guys that show up. Then set that equal to C, that's your answer. So to summarize, so remember, for each section, uh, you really want to know what is the form of the equation I'm looking at? What is the method to solve that form? Okay? So this is the process to solve an exact differential equation. So an exact first order differential equation has this form here. So it looks like m dx plus n dy equals zero. So on the quiz, if I ask you, what is the form of an exact differential equation? You are going to write this down and then you're going to tell me this criteria holds, right? So this is the form, this is the criteria that makes it exact. And this here is the method to solve, find the solution, method to find the solution of the above, right? So whenever, and again, this is something I mentioned before, I'm gonna mention it again, because it's very important. Whenever we're looking at different types of differential equations, you need to know what form does the equation have to be in so I can identify it. Then, is there a criteria that this form must fulfill that I know that I'm actually looking at one of the, the guys that have this type? Then you need to know what method should I apply to this type of differential equation in order to solve it. Here I just described method one. Compute the integral of m dx, compute the integral of n dy, ignore arbitrary constants, sum all the functions that appear, uh, do not double sum. Then your solution is going to be um, f of x comma y equals c, right? And of course here we can actually put in 
uh, your F is going to be that, and your F is going to be that. Right? So your F is going to be equal to both of these, but I, but in steps one and two, potentially each of these steps will be missing some data. So, but, so you can collect all the data by just adding, summing all the functions that appear. Anyone that's missed in step one, you'll pick them up in step two. Anyone that's missed in step two, you're gonna pick them up in step one. And so that's what you have. Okay, and here are some examples. So let's actually try to get through a couple of these and I'll leave the rest to you guys um, for uh, tomorrow. So consider this differential equation here. Consider, there's the word, consider. Some scary, scary word, okay? I'm gonna go through a full solution to this differential equation, et cetera. Okay, so now I see this differential equation shows up on a test or quiz. I am going to notice a couple things. First of all, I'm going to notice that it is not linear. I am also going to notice that it is not separable. I am also going to notice that if I replace x with a constant times x and y with a constant times y, I'm not going to get the original function back. Sure, this, the k's will get canceled in the first, the y over x. However, if I put, put 6kx, that's not going to magically disappear. You know, I put kx inside of the ln, it's not going to magically disappear. So by looking at this, I can know it's not separable, it's not linear, and it's not homogeneous. It is not any of the things that I've noticed before, right? So you need to know these rules very well, which is why I quiz you on them, and I need you to be able to answer very quickly. So because you are going to run through these things in your head, and there's going to come a point where I'm going to tell you what order these things should run through in your head. Okay, so I noticed that it's none of those guys. However, notice here that if I take my, Right? If, I, if I think of this guy here as m, because he's attached to the dx, and I think of this guy here as n, because he's attached to the dy, if I look at my, differentiate this with respect to y, I would get 1 over x. And if I look at next, differentiate this part with, with respect to x, I would get 1 over x. Notice that these guys are the same. That tells you exact. Okay, so I look at this, it's not separable, it's not linear, it's not homogeneous, what is it? Then I just do this quick check, uh, my versus next, they are the same. This means it's exact. Okay, so once you've identified it as an exact equation, how do you go about finding the solution? Well, we know. Um, we know that our f is going to be equal to the integral of m with respect to x. This is going to be the integral of y over x plus 6x dx with respect to x. This is going to be, because it's with respect to x, y ln of absolute value of x plus 3x squared, plus some constant of integration that we're going to end up ignoring anyway. I also want you to notice for this guy here, this is equal to ln of just regular x since x is positive. Right? So technically from the integral, you get absolute value of x, but we were told x is positive right here. Okay, so I just integrated with respect to x. Then I'm going to see that also f must be the integral of n with respect to y. So I'm going to integrate the n component, which is ln of x minus two with respect to y. This is going to be y ln x, minus 2y plus some other constant that I'm going to end up ignoring. And this is potentially a function of y and this is potentially a function of x. Now what I'm going to do, all the unique functions that appear, I'm going to find them. Okay, so I have the, I have the y ln x, that's repeated. I have the minus 2y and I have the 3x squared. So notice here, the C of Y in the top line is actually going to contain that minus two Y that you have in the bottom line, which is why I can ignore the C of Y because the guy that's there is going to be, the guy that's missing in line one, he shows up in line two. Also notice that the D of X is the missing three X squared. So the guy that's missing in line two is gonna show up in line one. So there are three unique functions that appear here. I'm just going to add them all up. Y ln X, 
plus 3x squared minus 2y, set that equal to c, that's my solution. Okay, any questions on that? Any questions at all? Anything that's confusing? Anything you're not sure? If you think I made a typo? Anything else? Are we clear on that? We good? I'm going to run through one more example, just quickly, again, and I'm, I'm actually going to do less explanation than I did even in the previous example. And then I'm going to leave these three examples for you guys to do. And you should be able to get through them uh, because on the quiz next week, I'm gonna test you on being able to do these. So these are going to be some good practice for you guys to try, as well as you can try, try the exact equations homework in your uh, web work. And you can apply, uh, try for this guy. Yes, so we'll have a quiz next Tuesday on, on everything we learned this week. All right, so let's run through this again. So here is a differential equation. First of all, I want to realize that the guy, the y prime is right here. So this guy here is actually your n. And it seems like Javon tried to trick us uh, because we weren't paying attention to detail. He expects us not to be a pay paying attention to detail and we're going to misidentify the M and N because we're always gonna think that the M shows up first. That is not how it works. The M is not the guy that shows up first. The M is the guy that's attached to the DX or the guy that if you write it in the Y prime notation, the M is the guy that doesn't have the derivative attached to it. The N is the guy that has the derivative attached to it. So that's the first thing. Here you're gonna realize Oh, yeah, Javon trying to trick me, but I'm not going to fall for it because I pay attention to details. And I know this table like the back of my hand. I know that the M is the guy that's attached to the DX, so he's not going to fool me. Okay, so that's the first thing. So first of all, I would notice that it is not linear because of the cosine Y. It is not separable. Um, and it is not homogeneous. Because if I replace, uh, because there's no way if I take a constant times x in the power of e that that's going to magically disappear. So now I'm starting to think maybe it's maybe it's a exact equation because we're we're only going to learn a few situations for first order. So now you start to think, okay, it might be exact. So I need to identify the m and n, and I'm going to find the my. So this is going to be e to the x plus cosine y, and then I'm going to find the next. This is going to be e to the x plus cosine y. Then I'm going to realize these guys are equal, so that tells me this is exact. Once I identify this as exact, I'm going to immediately go in, well, f is going to be the integral of m with respect to x. So this is going to be uh, y e to the x plus x sine y plus some constant of integration that I'm actually going to end up ignoring. Then I'm going to also find that f is the integral of n with respect to y. So I go to this part and I integrate with respect to y. I'm going to get y e to the x plus x sine y plus some other constant that I'm going to end up ignoring. And so now what I do, look at all the unique functions that show up, ignore them if they repeat in the next line. Then I'm going to just add those guys together set that equal to C, that's the answer. And that is how you would uh, find an exact, solve an exact differential equation. So we're gonna wrap up there, but what I do want you to do is try these for next time.
Uh, I'm going to leave these examples with you. And actually work on them. And we will pick up next time. Next time, we're going to learn how to use integrating factors with exact differential equations. You're going to realize that there are sometimes going to be situations where uh, you have something that's not really exact, but you're able to multiply it through by an integrating factor and to make it exact. So we'll actually deal with that next time as well. And you'll have a quiz on everything that we did uh, this, uh, this week. So it, we're going to have quizzes on first order linear applications, uh, homogeneous differential equations, and exact differential equations. So be prepared for that. And I think that's it. Yeah, when I say applications, I mean modeling. So you should know Newton's law of cooling. You should know uh, the uh, financial stuff and, and population stuff. You should also know how to deal with those mixture problems for the tank problems. So when I say applications, that's what I mean. So know about linear first order differential equations, know about the applications or modeling using linear first or using first order differential equations, know about how to solve homogeneous differential equations and know about exact differential equations. And by knowing them, I do mean you need to know things that are in the box. And if I ask you about specific things inside this box, you should be able to regurgitate it. Like if a quiz question says, what is the form of an exact differential equation? You should write down this line right here. If I ask, oh, what is the criteria that you would check on that form to know that it's exact? Then you'd write down m sub y equals n sub x, right? And then, of course, if I say this equation is exact, solve it. You should be able to solve it, right? So I can ask you about anything in this box, and it's on a quiz. I'm not going to ask you to regurgitate the entire box. I don't expect you to be typing all this out on a quiz, but I'm going to ask you about specific parts in methods and formulas that I give you, and you should know these. Right? These are things because if you don't know these, then you're going to have trouble identifying problems when there are a mixture of problems appearing. And you're not going to see how to solve a problem in general. So you really need to know these general forms and know how to identify them by looking at them and know what method should go along solving them. So we are going to wrap up there. Uh, try these for next time. I will post the notes here so you can see these as well, but you can take a screenshot right now. Try these for next time, and I will see you guys on Tuesday. Also, watch out for mass emails from me. Make sure you're getting emails from Jupyter Grades, and because if I have any information about the quiz or anything like I sent out last time, I will send it uh, through that channel. So uh, that's it. We're going to stop there for now. I will um, see you guys in the next one. Stay safe, everybody. Ciao.